of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. And in our last session, we looked at the, we began to uh, consider that foundational power and principle, gift and fruit, by which all of the Christian life is uh, empowered, and that is the indwelling presence of agape, which accompanies the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And in that last section, I mentioned some of the indicators that uh, that fruit of the Spirit is alive and well and working within the soul, and I'll repeat those briefly as we continue our study now of love. But first, let's open with prayer. Father, we know that we have the capacity to love as we do only because you have first loved us and because you have shed abroad in our hearts the love that is born of thy Holy Spirit. Give us a deeper understanding and appreciation for the concept of love that is that most precious gift to your people. For we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. When time ran out the last time, we, I was in the middle of giving a, a list of, uh, of indicators that you could look for to see if love was working in your life. I'll just mention those very quickly without uh, exposition before we go on to the new ones. I said in the first instance, agape disposes or inclines the soul to the honoring and worshiping of God. Secondly, that... Uh, uh, the presence of love inclines the soul to give credit and trust to the Word of God, not bringing a suspicious or arrogant spirit to the Word of God. And thirdly, that the presence and the power of agape inclines the person to acknowledge God's sovereign right to govern our lives. And that's as far as we were able to cover in our last uh, time together, so let's move on from there to the fourth indicator of uh, the presence of agape, and that is that love, as a gift and as a fruit, inclines the heart to desire justice toward our neighbors. You see, lo what love is doing here is that it is empowering us and changing us to make us want to embrace the very heart of, of our destiny to glorify God by keeping the great commandment, to love God with all of our heart. See how love is interjected there in the great commandment? With all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength, that is an intensity and a passion of love. And to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so if love is present, what love does within us is to move us in the direction not to condemn our neighbors or to defraud our neighbors or to cheat our neighbors, but to have a sensitive concern that justice be done, and not only justice, but a justice that is tempered with mercy. It minimizes and quenches the heart's natural fallen and corrupt tendency towards fraud and jealousy and slander and gossip. These are all, again, abstractions, but when was the last time you heard a sermon on gossip or on slander? Isn't it incredible that when God set forth the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the very foundation of the law for a society of, 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 of His people, that He made as part of the rodex of that culture, in the top ten, a prohibition against slander. Think for a moment how much your lives have been hurt by the words of other people, by the assault of the tongue against your character, sometimes justly, but many times unjustly. Love bites the tongue. You see, the Holy Spirit is not a slanderer. Satan is given the title that means slanderer. Slander is of the flesh. Cheating, frauding, gossiping, running down another person's name, tearing them apart. 
is in contrast and in opposition to the operation of love. Love edifies. Love builds up. It is not destructive towards one's neighbor. The fifth indicator, and this is an interesting one coming from Jonathan Edwards, that love disposes us toward contentment in whatever situation we find ourselves. Not in some kind of passive acquiescence, stoic imperturbability, you know, not a, uh, an apathy. There's a difference between apathy and contentment. But as the Apostle Paul in his own maturity and his own growth in the Spirit said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. How difficult that is to achieve in this world. Because as Blaise Pascal said, the great paradox of man, the thing that makes man the creature of the highest grandeur and at the same time the lowest misery, is that we can always contemplate a better life than we presently are able to enjoy. And we see a world of people running around with that spirit of restlessness of which Augustine wrote, that spirit of dissatisfaction, of discontent, thinking, if I could only make this move, or if I could only get that job, or if I could only buy this car, or if I could only win this championship, then I will be happy. And there is this elusive sense of contentment that's always beyond our grasp. But the Spirit of God, when He indwells you in the power of love, disposes your soul toward a, a state of contentment. And this is particularly true vocationally. As we begin to understand what a vocation is, a calling, and that our principal employer is God Himself. How many times does the New Testament enjoin us that whatever we do, do, you know, with all of our might and do it as unto the Lord? And what is contrasted with that? What is the way of the flesh? Not as men-pleasers performing our task with eye service. And so the contrast there is working to the glory of God or working from the perspective of eye service. What is eye service? that my performance, my duty, my work, my vocation, my labor, my employment is done only when somebody's watching me or I'm doing with it a view to your approval, to your accreditation, to your applause, and so on, rather than joyfully as a love offering of our lives, which is our reasonable service, as a living sacrifice offered to God. There's nobody that has that 100%. But what love does is it moves you and inclines you to see your very labor as unto the Lord. And that brings contentment. That makes it possible for a Christian to withstand the trials and the tribulation that so often attend your vocational duties. That's why Paul could say, you know, Slaves, obey your masters. Not because he was endorsing slavery, but he was saying, whatever place you find yourself in, you do your work under Christ, because who, who, is, who is regenerate would refuse to be a slave to Christ. We are all called to that in the joyous liberty of spiritual bondage to Christ. The paradox being that it's only in bondage to Christ that we find liberty. All right, the, uh, the next point that I want to mention in passing is that the presence of love restrains the power, the disease, the infection that perhaps is one of the most of all destructive powers to human personality, and I'm speaking of bitterness. 
And it's this point that rather than summarize Edwards' insights, I would like to take you to the text of Edwards himself. This is something I rarely do in lecture, to take time out to read passages from books, because I know that that tends to be very boring or distracting and difficult to follow when somebody's sitting in a classroom. But I, I promise it'll be brief, and I'll ask you this time that, you know, to concentrate just for a minute. And drink the bitter medicine if you have to. You know, I can't entertain you with gesticulations and all of that. I'm just going to have to read it from the text, but I want you to read it from Charity and Its Fruits, the best thing I've ever seen anywhere on love. Here's what Edward says. What a watch and guard should Christians keep against envy and malice and every kind of bitterness of spirit toward their neighbors. For these are the very reverse of the real essence of Christianity. It behooves Christians, as they would not by their practice directly con contradict their profession, to take heed to themselves in this manner. They should suppress the first beginnings of ill will and bitterness and envy. Watch strictly against all occasions of such a spirit. Strive and fight to the utmost against such a temper that tends in that direction. And avoid as much as possible all temptations that may lead to it. This is nothing more than a synopsis of the homily of the author of the book of Hebrews. A Christian should at all times keep a strong guard against everything that tends to overthrow or corrupt or undermine a spirit of love, because that which hinders love to men hinders the exercise of love to God. If love is the sum of Christianity, surely those things which overthrow love are exceedingly unbecoming for Christians. Now here's the, the last sentence. Uh, or the last two sentences, and I want you to hear these particularly. An envious Christian, a malicious Christian, a cold and hard-hearted Christian is the greatest absurdity and contradiction. It is as if one would speak of dark brightness or false truth. It just cannot be. That doesn't mean that Christians never have to struggle with resentment. If that were not the case, the New Testament would not waste its breath with so many admonitions and exhortations against that root of bitterness that we allow to spring up in our lives, and then we begin to feed it and nurture it and allow it to infect the whole spirit and bring us to ruin. We are vulnerable to malice, to resentment, to bitterness, particularly in terms of our interpersonal relationships. But what Edwards is saying here is again what the New Testament says again and again, fight that with all your might. See, that's the things that we need to be conscious of if we're really going to grow in grace to be aware of those things that quench the Spirit and destroy the power of love within us. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit now about some practical principles of how we can augment this kind of a manifestation of love, particularly to other people, the love toward the neighbor and the cultivation of the spirit of charity or the amiable spirit of which the Bible speaks. We have a phrase in theology called the judgment of charity. Every time I'm involved with another human being, that involvement is a very complicated thing. There's a dynamic interaction that takes place on several levels. I was walking through a, a man's office the other day, and uh, 
and we were having conversation, and I was responding to seeing his office for the first time, and his, his work, and uh, his secretary, and all of that. And there was a conversation going on verbally, and I was hearing what he was saying, and then I was thinking in my mind, and then I was speaking back. That's the normal process, isn't it? But I was not always saying what I was thinking. I don't reveal with my lips everything that's going on in my mind. I was aware of myself of making evaluations of the whole operation, of the whole setup. And then I stopped and I thought in the middle of that, and I thought, he's probably doing the same thing. <laughs> Wonder what he's thinking, you know? Do you ever uh, experience that? Wonder what people are really, really thinking. Well, the point I want to make is this, that in every human interaction, there is constantly a process of evaluation going on. Do I like what you're saying? Do I like you? Do I like what you're doing? Do I like how you look? I am making those evaluations, you know, not necessarily with a checklist, not necessarily with conscious intensity at every moment, but it's all going, always going on there, isn't it? We are judging each other. Now, that's part of the reason why we play so many games of hide-and-seek with each other and are so very, very careful about letting ourselves be known intimately. I talked to the leader of one of the largest Christian organizations in America not too long ago, and he said this to me. He said, R.C., I hope that when I die, there will be five people who will be able to sit through my funeral without looking at their watches. And it almost made me cry, because there is a sense in which we are fortunate if there are five people that care that much about us. Most of our caring of other people is very casual, it's very fleeting, it's very temporary. It can be real and intense for a moment, but then we learn how to switch it off and go about our own business. Now, what the man was saying is, I want at least five people to love me. Is there anybody in this room that does not want to be loved? Many of us would be satisfied with one. One person whom we knew for sure loved us. But you see, everybody feels like that. And at the very bottom line of, the, of terms of the definition of what our obligation is toward our neighbor is the golden rule. And it's not the exclusive province of liberal Christianity. It should be at the heart of evangelical Christianity. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I want other people to love me. I want them to be loving toward me. I want them to exercise charity towards me. And now that gets us to what we mean by the judgment of charity. The judgment of charity is simply this, and, we, and this is something that is a skill that can be developed through practice, and it is the practice of the benefit of the doubt. It is not a practice in naivete. We know that human beings are capable of malicious acts of evil. We know how corrupt people can be. You know, one of the most meaningful compliments I've ever received in my life came from my son. Not too long ago, he said to me, Dad, I can't understand you. I said, why? He said, for somebody who believes in the total depravity of mankind as much as you do, you're the most trusting person I've ever met. <laughs> now, he meant it as a criticism. But it was a left-handed criticism because I took it as a compliment. I said, really? Is that the way you think I am, that I'm too trusting and everything? Whoa! I'm so glad because I would much rather err in the direction of over-trusting somebody than by slandering them by under-trusting them. That's what the judgment of charity is all about, of granting the benefit of the doubt to the other person. Now, one other way, in practical terms, that I like to define what the judgment of charity, the practice of love in human relationships is, is the difference between what we call 
best case analysis and worst case analysis. When an event takes place, when a deed is done, a word is spoken, we know that God is concerned not only with the external action that has taken place, but God also reads the heart. And God is very much concerned about motive, about the intention of the heart. And we understand, even at an at, at earthly level, in our, our judicial processes in the law courts, that we make distinctions between first-degree murder and second-degree murder and so on. And part of that distinction lies in whether or not it can be established that there was what? Malice aforethought. That becomes an examination, not simply of the deed itself that was committed, but whether or not that deed was committed in a premeditated fashion. Hmm? Because we understand humanly that a premeditated malicious motive intensifies the evil of the action. Now, what worst case analysis is, is when we play the game of reading other people's hearts when they injure us and when they hurt us, when they bring pain to us, worst case analysis is when we attribute to them the worst of all possible motives. Let me say it again. Worst case analysis is attributing to other people the worst of all possible motives for their actions which we find painful to ourselves. And when we do it, we better learn how to recognize it because that is not of God. That is destructive. Now, I grant that there are people in this world who lie in bed at night thinking up all the more devious ways by which they can torment you or me. But even in a society of reprobate, unregenerate pagans, people with that kind of malicious forethought and devious intent, thanks be to the common grace and restraining power of God, are in a minority, and a very small minority. It's very unlikely when somebody hurts you that they meant to hurt you as badly as they did. The opposite of worst case analysis is best case analysis. Best case analysis is, as I say, just the opposite where we attribute the best of all possible causes or motives to the actions that hurt. Now, there are some people who practice that to a fault. I know one woman who just simply cannot believe that anybody ever sins. <laughs> She's incapable of attributing a, an evil motive to somebody. She's constantly excusing everybody for everything in such a way as that it makes it begin to feel that that person just simply can't stand conflict, that this isn't necessarily a manifestation of the gift of the, or the fruit of the Spirit as it is a weakness of her own personality. That can happen, but that's rare too. Attributing the best of all possible motives to sinful actions, unfortunately, is a practice we normally reserve for whom? For ourselves. <laughs> huh? One of the best examples of that I know of, and I don't want to isolate this person unfairly, but the example is, is so valuable because everybody's aware of it is the President of the United States, the only President in the United States in our history who was forced to resign his office. The forced resignation of Richard Nixon happened because the public became convinced that the President had lied in a cover-up scheme in the White House. And when President Nixon finally resigned. He came before the people of America and confessed his sin before he resigned. I think the four words, more than any other words that were ever spoken by Richard Nixon that cost him the presidency were the four words he spoke when he addressed the nation and he said, 
I made a mistake that in fueled and intensified the anger. I talked to a United States senator of the opposing party who said to me, if Richard Nixon would have gone up there and said, I lied, I'm sorry, please forgive me, that particular senator believed that the nation would have forgiven him and accepted it. But when he said, I made a mistake, you see, he softened it because Basically, we don't think of mistakes as moral matters. They are in an ultimate theological sense, but we don't put somebody in jail for, because they made a mistake of adding five and two, and they come up with eight. But that's a best case in evaluation. And the point is that makes me feel sorry for Richard Nixon is that what infuriated the nation when he did that was that Nixon was doing what we all do. Everybody does that. We all tend to look at our own sins and our own mistakes and our own harmful actions against other people in the best of all possible lights. In fact, the most frequent statement we make when somebody confronts us and said, you hurt me, you offended me, you violated me, you brought pain to me, the first thing you say is, gee, what? I didn't mean to. Now, well, the truth of what actually happens may sometimes be in between, but as I said a moment ago, love tends to err in the direction of charity. We need to begin to practice best case analysis, or at least better case analysis, and above all, avoid worst case analysis in dealing with those who have hurt us. When we begin to practice that, then love is strengthened and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit begins to be nourished. And we'll look at those fruits in our next session.